Broadway seven days a week on WKAR-TV in East Lansing, a service of Michigan State University. Now, our country wasn't built on factories and machines. It has its origins back in fur trapping. The fur traders and voyagers were the ones who settled Michigan. They trapped a variety of animals, but all of them were rodents and predators. That's what fur trappers go after. That's what provides basically the fur that we have today. The trapping tradition is alive and well. It's done basically the same way it was done two, three hundred years ago, and we're going to take you trapping, show you what that's all about. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north It's history of copper mines and iron ore The Great Lakes fisheries To the farmlands of the southern counties We'll look around again At all that waits the sportsmen in the state of Michigan And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees Listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in this state of Michigan What do you think these are both for? How much? Oh, uh, they go about 33, 45. You're watching a Southern Michigan Trappers Association fur auction in Marshall, Michigan. People bidding are fur buyers. Some of them are furriers, but most are brokers, middlemen who are buying for someone else. Foxes, mink, muskrat, raccoon, coyote, opossum, skunk, they all have their price. And where do these furs come from? from Michigan, from trappers. Very few of them are big time operators. Most trappers run relatively small trap lines that provide small side incomes in the fall and winter. Carl Crofts is a typical trapper. He traps around his home in Bath, Michigan. Marshes, streams, fields. He checks these areas out and asks permission to set trap lines in the fall. Now today we're following him as he checks a small pond on his sister's property where muskrats have caused problems every year digging tunnels under the yard. Now it's an extremely small pond, but every year muskrats move in and burrow. The riding lawnmower hits the soft spots and the tunnels cave in. So she asks Carl to trap the muskrats out, usually in December. Every day he checks the four traps that he sets along the banks. No rats in trap number one, so he leaves it set. Now, muskrats are referred to as rats. They're, they are a rodent. They're a large member of the rat family, but they live in marshes. Their fur quality is good. It's not highly valuable, but worth several dollars a piece for each pelt. Now, even a small-time trapper can usually trap a hundred or so muskrats in a season. That's worth three or four hundred dollars at a fur auction. Trap number two. The foothold trap is only a foot or so under the ice and can be seen without disturbing it. It's still on the board, untouched, so Carl leaves that one alone too. Now this is typical, most of the traps being empty. Even the best trapper has to make many sets to catch a few fur bearers. Now trapping is probably the most misunderstood of all outdoor activities. It has the appearance of cruelty to many people who don't understand nature and don't understand trapping. Now the quarry in trapping is rodents or predators that have fur that's valuable on the market. Species that are in high demand are often raised on fur farms to supplement the natural production. So when foxes, for example, aren't trapped, more are raised on farms. So not trapping animals doesn't really save them, especially with the fur farms. And the way they're caught in the wild, in foothold traps, not, not leg hold traps, there aren't any sharp jaws or strong springs used. The leg hold trap is a misnomer. These traps are set underwater for muskrats. They rarely catch anything but a muskrat. And they don't kill the rats violently. Now, they drown them quickly, as, actually as humanely as animals are killed in slaughterhouses for food or for their fur. 
It's actually the best method going for muskrats. Other types of quick kill traps, like the conibear, can be used for other species. But the problem with these quick kill traps on dry land is that infrequently animals are caught that aren't wanted. And if they're caught in a foothold trap, they can be released unharmed if if they're being held in a foothold trap. The stories, by the way, of animals chewing their legs off, well, those are rare nowadays. Not a significant part of the trapping scene. And then, of course, we hear the stories of trappers who check their traps once a week. Animals suffering. Simply not true. Besides being inhumane, which trappers avoid, checking traps every day is just good business. Now, Look, look at it this way, an animal left in a trap more than a day is likely to be eaten by a predator, or at least it's going to start to spoil, which reduces its quality and price. So trappers check their traps daily because it's in their own best interest, if nothing else. Then there's the question of using the meat. Yes, much of the meat is used from trapped animals. Muskrats, raccoons, opossums, and beavers are often eaten by trappers. If not, the carcasses are sold or given away. Uh, predators like fox aren't eaten as often, but I have been sent fox recipes by viewers who say they're tasty. Problem is, they just don't have much appeal to many people. Now, the pelts have the main value, and for every two hours working a trap line, a trapper spends, oh, usually at least an hour preparing his pelts for sale. The whole animal is cleaned and combed, and then it's skinned. Now, these are things a trapper has to do himself if he wants to make any money at all. And the better care he takes of his pelts, the higher price they're going to bring from fur buyers. Trapping season is in the fall and early winter because it's at that time of year that the pelts are in prime condition. They're the most valuable when the long, thick winter fur is new, the guard hairs are long, and the pelt is considered prime. Now, as the winter wears on, so do the coats of the animals in the wild. Their hair breaks off, falls out, loses quality. And the meat, by the way, on animals like muskrats, beaver, and raccoons is excellent. It's often a part of wild game dinners, even the exotic Safari Club International dinners put on each spring. The fur bearers that aren't predators eat vegetation, and they're as clean and healthy as you'd want. There's just sort of a stigma about eating an animal that has the word rat in its name. So at wild game dinners, they're oftentimes referred to as marsh rabbits. Sounds a little better, doesn't it? Well, after skinning the muskrat, it has to be fleshed out, the pieces of meat removed with a draw knife, and trappers get very adept at this skill. Spend a lot of time at it, too. When the scraping and fleshing is done, the last step is stretching and drying. Now, these steps that Carl Crofts just showed us have to be done with every animal. Now, once they go through this, they can be stretched and dried and saved for the fur sale. Now, most trappers save their hides and pelts till the end of the season, sell them all at once, and they have several choices. They can locate a buyer from outside the state or even from a foreign country. A lot of furs go overseas. They can use a local buyer who's a middleman, or they can go to an auction sponsored by one of the regional trappers associations, like the Southern Michigan Trappers Association held in Marshall. Now the five, now you can be a 385, now the 90. The buyers look over the furs carefully. They don't want any nicks, cuts, or thin spots in the skin. They want to pay by the size, the quality of the fur. Sometimes the trappers get the 550 they want per pelt. Sometimes they don't. You bought it, number 13, number 13, five and a half. Were you happy with what you got? Oh, I would like more. I sold them for 450. I would like more. You think they were worth more? Oh, sure. A lot of hard work. How do you feel when they go up on the block and they say sold 450? Well, <laughs> that's the way it is? That's the way it is, I guess. There's not a whole lot a guy can do, but you can turn it down if you don't like the price. So, I sold my other fur at Alba, the other fur sale. Mm -hmm. Do you have a good year? Pretty decent. Why do you trap? For the enjoyment, more than anything else. I like it a lot. It's a lot of fun. What's fun about it? Oh, you get cold and you get wet and you just get out in the outer doors. It's, I like the outdoors a lot. How about, do you make enough money to pay for it? Well, the money's not that important. Just, I like to do it. It's really a lot of fun. 
You talk to most of the trappers, they'll tell you the same thing. Trapping is seasonal, it's part-time, but they all do it because they enjoy it. A Trappers Association's fur sales about the only fur farm pelts are those from the Silver Fox. Otherwise, most of these furs are trapped in woodlots and marshes in Michigan. Trappers enjoy the outdoors. They enjoy the money. They enjoy the challenge, the simplicity of trapping, but they also know they're keeping the occupation alive that founded this country. Traditions as American as apple pie and pot-bellied stoves, trapping and fur trading, an important part of our American outdoor heritage. The tremendous economic value of furs around the world, of course, is one motivation for trappers to get out and trap, but there's another motivation, the problems that some of these fur bearers, the rodents cause, especially right now in the Upper Peninsula. Beaver damage has been extensive, looks to be a real problem coming up across the UP to roads because of their dams. The DNR is issuing permits for additional trapping, dynamiting the dams, as well as shooting beavers on site because of the potentially millions of dollars we're looking at uh, in damage caused by them in the UP. Another problem here we have uh, facing the deer is a lot of starvation up, especially Iron, Dickinson counties. DNR reports that the starvation is the earliest on record. So our booming deer herd looks like it's in for problems along the Manistee River in the lower peninsula, Kalkaska County. We're also finding starvation reports there. We're gonna be up there with our cameras in another week to see how serious this is. <laughs> See the tip-up flag in the lower left. It was set in 20 feet of water, two feet off the bottom, baited with a five-inch shiner minnow. Who pulled it up? Five-year-old Ryan Raymond of Clare. His first trophy, a 22-inch northern pike. Ryan asked his dad if his picture could be on Michigan Outdoors. There you go, Ryan. 11-year-old Brian Milkowski of Linwood was fishing Saginaw Bay in the middle of January, caught a trophy yellow perch, 15 inches long, weighed in at one pound, 12 ounces, a master angler qualifier, but I don't think Brian had it registered. Here's young Devin Cook from Flint, who was fishing Pratt Lake near Gladwin last summer using a minnow, and caught a trophy crappie. As Uncle Ken said, it might make master angler, probably would have if Devin had a weight on certified scales, but since it was two inches over the Stroh's fishing award minimum, this 15-incher makes the trophy book based on length. And I've heard that Lake Cadillac produces some big bluegills, but that's one lake I've never fished. It's on my list for this summer, though. Benjamin Kaufman from Mount Pleasant is only six years old, but I tell you, age does not hold you back in fishing. He was dunking a nightcrawler in Lake Cadillac last July and pulled out, get this, a 12-inch, one-pound, 11-ounce bluegill. All I can say is, wow, I'm impressed. 12-year-old Matt Thunnel from DeWitt was fishing in Shelter Bay, Lake Superior last August, trolling a silver spoon when a 38 and a half inch lake trout hit. Now Matt pulled it in himself, and according to the local scales, it weighed 27 pounds. He should be proud of that catch. And what do you think? Does Ted Kroll from Hamburg look proud of this catch? In August, the six-year-old was bottom fishing a night crawler, but his dad gave him odds and ends for tackle. I mean, a two-foot ice fishing rod with a spin cast reel. Mattered not, Ted hauled in a 19-inch smallmouth bass, showing that kids can catch trophies too and find their way into our trophy book. Congratulations to them all. Representatives from the People's Republic of China are here with a very special panda exhibit they'll be taking across Michigan over the next month. They're doing that to try and raise funds for panda restoration. Now, these representatives are from the Sichuan province, which gave our Michigan DNR a, the Chinese black neck or the Sichuan bird, which we hope to restore, uh, which we hope will restore pheasant hunting to Michigan. So be generous in thinking about a contribution to the panda fund. Mild weather has postponed a pheasant transplant that was supposed to take place. Kansas birds to Michigan under the auspices of DNR and Wildlife Unlimited. The weather's been so good out there, they have not been able to bait the pheasants into the traps. And another moose is dead, and Steve Schmidt, biologist and veterinarian, has confirmed it. It was brainworm. You've determined the latest moose dried, or died of brainworm. Yes, that's right, Bob. Uh, the last uh, cow that died uh, a couple days ago, it was definitely brain worm. We found one adult worm on top of the brain. Is there um, any indication the rest of the moose herd is uh, suffering from brain worm? Have you, have you got some animals slowing down in the field or anything that you know of? 
No, it's, it, that would be hard to determine. And uh, as far as we know, we don't have any, any other animals that are uh, showing symptoms from brain worm. We'll, but we'll just have to take it and, you know, see what happens. Are you optimistic at all from a, now you're, you're not only a wildlife biologist, you're a veterinarian. That's right, Bob. What, 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 do, you, what do you think? Are you still optimistic about the uh, moose transplant? Oh, very much so, yeah. Just because we've, you know, lost a few animals, that uh, doesn't mean that, that uh, the whole uh, herd is going to go under. We, we feel very optimistic about it. Non-game checkoff is, of course, a good money saver on your taxes and, of course, contributing to the game in Michigan, also contributing to the enjoyment of Wild Game, our Wild Game cooking contest. We are a few days late because of the multitude of recipes we've received and notifying the winners, but that'll be coming out at the first part of next week. I wish I could taste them all. Oh, I think you will during the coming <laughs> year, one time or another. Bob, we have some questions from our viewers here. Here's one from uh, Bob Andrews in Flint. He asked about handguns. He says, what is the legal caliber and barrel length for handguns in hunting deer? Well, you've got to divide Michigan really up into two portions, the northern lower and the upper in one portion, and the southern lower in the other. Just about anything goes north of that Bay City to Muskegon line, uh, any any barrel length, just so long as it isn't something like a 22 caliber rimfire. Mm -hmm. But south of that, we've got new rules and regulations for this first year deer hunt. Uh, barrel lengths we know are going to be a minimum of three and a half inches. You're going to have to use a repeating handgun. Uh, as for the caliber, we don't know yet. The DNR is charged with formulating a list that won't be out till sometime around the first of April. Keep you posted on that as soon as it happens. This letter for you too, Fred, from Leon Hank of Holt, Michigan. Uh, he writes, every hunting season for the last 20 years, I have enjoyed great shooting at sharp tail grouse near Sault Ste. Marie. Can you tell me why these game birds inhabit only three or four counties in the eastern upper peninsula of Michigan? They seem to like habitats similar to what pheasants need. Why don't we find these birds in other parts of the state? Well, they really don't like habitat that pheasants use. I like the farm country. Sharp tails will not survive in farm country. They need some open grassland like they find in that part of the UP. Now, there is an area in the Lower Peninsula, Macosta, Isabella, uh, that area. There's about four counties there that Pete Squibb from the DNR says they will try releasing sharp tails in that area. Now, we used to have sharp tails there. That's where Howard Shelley got a great story. Howard Shelley from Michigan Outdoors. He's going to be up in just a moment. But first, let's see if you can answer this question, this fisherman's question, fishing fanatic's question in our outdoor quiz. What's the longest number of hours one person has ever fished continuously? Well, John Reeder of England must have had a bad case of fishing fever. He fished for 504 hours or 21 days, setting the record between August 20th and September 10th, 1978. So this will be our ninth winter going to Brownsville. Our trailer is already down there. We left it last spring, mm -hmm. and uh, we hope to spend the winter there, come back next April. and. Uh, Howard Shelley, a face and a voice that Michigan sportsmen saw every week on Morton F's Michigan Outdoors. I had the pleasure of working with Howard in the late 1960s, and although he's retired now and wintering in the south with his wife Ruth, his films are classics. The one he did when sharp-tailed grouse lived in the Lower Peninsula is particularly appropriate right now. Maybe you remember this when Howard visited us a few years ago. What's this one called? This one takes place, I think, around... This area, sharp-tailed grouse country? Right. There's very few sharp-tailed grouse left in Michigan. A few in the Upper Peninsula, mm -hmm. but in the Lower Peninsula, in an area 15, 20 miles northwest of Houghton Lake. That's uh, just about the only place. And uh, I went in there with one of the conservation officials a few years ago in the early in the spring to film this. And uh, again, it was one of those deals where, oh, no, it can't be done. But I accepted the challenge, moved my equipment in the day before, came in during the middle of the night and got in the blind. And as I was there, well hidden, and very quiet, at the break of day. Now the reason the sharp tails come to this particular area is because there's a special type of food that uh, grows there. Uh, you or I would call it just a, a weed, but uh, I believe the proper term is it's called a sweet fern. And that's one of the reasons why the sharp tail will come into this area. So that morning, hardly with enough light, one single sharp tail flew in, landed on that old stump 30 feet away, and then another had come walking in, popped his head up over the top of the weeds, and then another until I had 10 or 11 of them within 15 or 20 feet of my blind. Now they were very alert and skeptical at first, but not for long because now 
Well, daylight had gone by for 20 minutes, and for the next hour, you're going to see one of the most amazing displays of the dance of the Sharptails, I think, ever recorded on film. And strangely, it's the males that put on the dance, and more or less in a surrounding circle out around the edge will be the females watching possibly uh, thinking, uh, well, we'll make a selection as to who's the best dancer for a future mate. But the males will stand there, wings outspread, and then go into a dance. And you can see readily right there hmm. why they're called sharp tail grouse. And chances are, going back to the days of the Indians, that's where the name come from because they were very close to them, watched them, and gave them that name, sharp tail grouse. Now there's the close-up of the sweet fern that the grouse like eating so well and as to why they come back to the same area morning after morning from late March into early May. Now when you suddenly see a pair of the males approach each other, squat very low, spread out their wings, you'd think very seriously that there was going to be a real knock-down, drag-out fight here. But no, that's just part of the dance of the sharp tails. A Howard Shelley classic. He'll be back in Michigan in a month or so. We're going to be sure to invite him to our fishing awards banquet. That's one of the events coming up on our outdoor calendar. If you haven't really preferred the spicy dishes that sometimes we've had here on Michigan Outdoors, I think this recipe is for you. Very, very mild. <laughs> very mild, bordering on bland. That's right. In my book. Absolutely. However, this is the second time I've had this recipe, and I I like it a lot better now than I did before. Well, I think you were expecting bland this time, so it tastes better to you. You know, <laughs> I think you got something there, because a lot of what we have, we put a lot of spices mm -hmm. in and, and so on. This is called steak and onion pie. Uh, Deb and Terry Harvey from Howell oh. sent it in. It's got a lot of spices in it, really. It's got paprika, ginger, and allspice, which you usually find in desserts. Some potatoes, onion, and your venison. Very, very well-trimmed venison. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to fry the onion slices. Just until they're transparent, you don't want them real browned because you're going to bake this all afterwards. It doesn't take very long either. You're going to remove those to a dish, and then you're going to brown the meat pieces, but you could dip them in the flour first. This breading uh, for this venison, the first time you cooked this, Kathy, I thought was terrific. we got paprika, and paprika comes from a red bell pepper, really, and it's ground very, very fine. No hot taste to it, really, just more for color. Some black pepper. I know it's probably not enough for you, Fred. Well, I was willing to hang with this because of all the spices. <laughs> and ginger, and now I prefer fresh ginger, but this called for ground. I would have used just real, sliced real thin ginger root. And allspice. <clears throat> and like I say, it's used mostly in desserts. And it uh, tastes like clove and nutmeg and um, cinnamon. Is it really a combination of spices? No, it, it's a little brown berry is what it is, but that's what it tastes like. Oh. All those. Huh. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to brown these in the flour that you put all the spices in. And I'll tell you, Bob, if you cook up some venison just like that and brown it, mm -hmm. you love it. And remove it from you there. Just cook, eat it right there before yep. she put the water before in. I, yeah. Salt, I'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. It was very, very tasty. And you put way. a couple cups of water two in. Two cups for... of water and going to let it simmer for an hour. Then we're going to add two cups of potatoes. And we just want those cooked 10 minutes because it is going to bake for a half hour. So you just want them tender. And that's just crisp. Crisp mm -hmm. tender, not completely done. This pie crust was different. It's a pastry that uses an egg and under the hot lights. It didn't stay together very well. <laughs> okay, you go put all this in a grease casserole dish and then the onions on top of it and so they're not mixed all the way through. And the pastry on top. Slit air vents in it and let it bake for a half hour at 425 degrees. Now, when I first served this to Zach, my son, he said, oh, got to have some peas and carrots, oh, carrots and things like that. Yes, I would have added celery. I don't know. I don't know, Bob. I think this is a, a good alternative for people who don't like, you know, venison dishes loaded with things. Fred, I'm not a big fan of the, I won't name any brand names, the big pot pie, mm -hmm. sort of the three for a buck type. Mm -hmm. uh, just don't like them at all. And, and I really didn't think I was going to like this one. However, 
I will trade you a uh, tomato here for another uh, <laughs> another piece of that. If that's that, that is, is darn good. Oh, you know that allspice. I think those spices in there they do come through. And if when you put other ingredients, when you know ingredients... what you're looking for, the taste you're looking for. Yeah, I don't think it's bland at, bland at all. It's just not spicy, but it's not bland. Just it's a little bit different, and you couldn't you couldn't appreciate the flavor of the spices in the meat if you had more That's things right. in it. Good recipe. Right. Great recipe. Steak and onion pie from Terry and Deb Harvey from Howell. That's right. A good one. Bob, tell the folks where they can get a copy. Get out in the outer doors. It's, I like the outer doors a lot. Do you make enough money to pay for it? Well, the money's not that important. Just, I like to do it. It's really a lot of fun. You talk to most of the trappers, they'll tell you the same thing. Trapping is seasonal, it's part-time, but they all do it because they enjoy it. A Trappers Association's fur sales about the only fur farm pelts are those from the Silver Fox. Otherwise, most of these furs are... Trappers enjoy the outdoors. They enjoy the money, they enjoy the challenge, the simplicity of trapping, but they also know they're keeping the occupation alive that founded this country. Traditions as American as apple pie and pot-bellied stoves, trapping and fur trading, an important part of our American outdoor heritage.